Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. Now, in this episode, the hardest part was figuring out not what I what I should tell you, but what I can tell you. You see, well, the Herson Offensive, which is one of the two important events that I'll be talking about here, there is a there is a request by Zelensky to to keep some information out of the public eye. And besides some strikes, and besides what's going on, that means that uh, until some events have uh, happened, I hope that they would happen last night, they didn't, but, um, well, I can't just reveal everything to you that I know. But I'll try my best. Just um, don't get don't get too excited. And, uh, well, I'll start with that, and then we'll move on to the death of Gorbachev, because I have a few things to say about that one, too. And then about a, a personal experience that literally happened to me last night. At any rate, for starters, Rostovich, who has been recently promoted to colonel, well, obviously he also doesn't comment on the specifics or the geography of the Ukrainian advance in Kherson, but uh, there is a, there's a small counteroffensive, and this isn't a huge one right now. There's a counterattack that's been somewhat successful, but um, it's not that massive. And it broke through the first line of Russian defenses in several lo- ro- locations. And currently, they're trying to process deeper into the Russian occupied territory. During the night, they had some setbacks. They had recaptured four villages, and ap- apparently, according to Girkin, but in this specific occasion, I don't trust Girkin's opinion. Well, he basically states that it all faltered, which I know for sure is not true. So, Girkin, I think he's a. Um, He's a bit panicky and at a loss here. We'll get back to what he says about Gorbachev, but for now, Girkin's opinions on Ukrainian successes are interesting, although one thing that he mentions makes me think a bit. At any rate, simultaneously, several bridges were hit by artillery and HIMARS, which would be Antonovsky Bridge and the Antonovsky Railway Bridge, Daryavsky and Novokohovk Bridges. Later in the evening, pontoon ferries were hit together with Russian military equipment since they tried to move. Another two pontoon bridges were destroyed or damaged. All the Dnipro crossings are under Ukrainian fire control. Which means that uh, nothing can get over on that side of Dnipro. Which means that there are some units stuck there. Now, Russians in all this situation really counterattacked last night. They uh, counter counterattacked in a way they were using a lot of artillery. And according to some reports that I can give you, is the fact that they just blasted out with their kind of imprecise uh, Hovitzer artillery, but they shelled a lot, and I mean a lot, a lot, to the point that uh, in this morning, a lot of these artillery units that the Russians have, they had experienced critical mal- malfunctions, i.e. some of them really started blowing up, because, um, well, if you've been listening to Perun, and I mentioned this previously as well, it's not really good to kind of cover the uh, cover your enemies with artillery fire indiscriminately, because each each firing each time you fire an artillery cannon, you see, it um, it has a chance to get damaged or broken down, and they wear down over time. And if you've noticed, uh, all the bridges from which the Ukrainian, the sorry, the Russian units uh, supplied there, well, can be supplied, they're down, and they can't get their resupplies. So, Russian soldiers, who are not very well trained, and normally, well, basically they just fire as much as they can, accuracy is not their number one priority, which, by the way, they also praise HIMARS for, for its high accuracy. Uh, Accuracy is not their main priority, it's usually been, well, you know, just mass of troops and uh, and all sorts of things. You know, by according to training, they just blast, 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 then at some point a new kind of barrel of a cannon arrives, they exchange it, because cannon art- artillery, although shorter range, is much easier to use in these distances than rocket artillery. And then they would get their barrel changed, but this simply isn't happening, and field repairs are extremely hard to do when you're under attack. So, that's an interesting situation right there. The Ukrainian forces, the air forces, are, obviously, targeting the Russian logistics and reserves, including the troops and equipment reinforcements on the left side of the Dnieper River that the Russian command is trying to send to the Kherson region. Again, this ties in 
to basically this whole situation. The success of the Ukrainian aviation in this area, by the way, can be can be basically attributed after the destruction of Russian air defense radars, which happened just a few days prior. Now, we know that um, Ukrainians have asked for some uh, weaponry, weaponry for an assault that, um, well, Western partners have delivered. And not just the United States, mind you. Now, this is, uh, this is this much I know from my sources. And, uh, well, let's just say, <clears throat> let's just say that we'll follow this one up, but um, Ukraine is only starting to attack. It's not going to go easy. It's not going to be very quick. And Kherson, well, um, I would treat it like, um, like an exercise, which is, by the way, uh, what Girkin also states, and that's the one fact where I could believe him. Counterattack will not be so fast, because this is um, interesting. Now, I know some dates, and I have, I've been given some precise exact dates about some events that are, are supposed to happen, but sadly I can't reveal them to you right now, because that would be very irresponsible on my part, really. But uh, let, you, let, let me just uh, say you that uh, some big interesting things are going to happen, hopefully. Hopefully very soon as well, because, well, last night... Russians could rely on just overblasting artillery, and um, well, today they really can't. And it's blowing up, and there's a lot, a lot of soldiers on that side of Dnieper River. And also, um, like I said, I have been informed by some by certain assault weaponry that has been delivered to Ukraine without announcing it anywhere publicly. And even on the official report by the United States government, you can see that they only have fulfilled an order of weapons, including for assault, requested by Ukraine. They didn't even specify what it was. Now, trust me on this one. You'll hear about them maybe after this podcast comes out at some point. It's going to be interesting on the on the war front. Meanwhile, in the other directions, apparently a shadow conscription is also starting, kind of a secret conscription is starting in Moscow and St. Petersburg. A covert one. They're trying to do it slowly. They're kind of basically dragging in people for the winter for the winter terms, and they're doing things. They're sort of preparing uh, new fresh meat to be sent on to the front lines there in Russia, because their full conscription isn't working very well. Wagner Group is also active, but... Um, they are, unless they want to do full mobilization, which would mean, mean political death for Putin. Yeah, this is uh, not going on very well. The Russian positions in Melitopol, as well as other directions in south and southeast, yeah, they're being hit by high Mars. The harassment strategy by the Ukrainians is very likely to continue. In the Melitopol direction, the Russian defense is hindered by local topography and lack of natural defenses, but sadly, the liberation of Crimea is still quite a ways off. In the east, the Russian troops uh, have kept trying to circumvent Bakhmut and attack in the direction of Slovyansk Kramatorsk, which, well, has been under attack for such a long time that I don't even remember the first time I mentioned these. And uh, there have been small-scale clashes around small villages, like Pieski, and that stuff's possible. The long-expected Russian reinforcements, the Third Army Corps, have arrived, basically force of 15,000 men were scattered through more than 1,000 kilometers of front line. However, as Russian logistics and river crossings are severely compromised, it is already challenging to keep the current 30 armored, armored personal carriers in the Kherson region, let alone trans transferring and maintaining more reinforcements to the southern war theater. Russian troops already in the region... Uh, yeah, I, th I think they have a one-way ticket to uh, certain locations. Now... Obviously, currently, the referendums, so-called referendums, are an idea that Russians had been, you know, aiming for to officially declare this whole territory Russia. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're not really coming. But in general, to, to finish up with this Kherson offensive thing, up until the point that I can talk to you about this, is that the Ukrainian army and Air Force, they started the counteroffensive after obtaining all the means that uh, were necessary for it. And the long-range missiles, the super, super long-range missiles, 
they're not that critical, but important to target quite quite deep into enemy's rear. And, um, you know, currently weapons need to be supplied more. Artillery weapons, mostly 155mm artillery weapons and ammo, so that they can keep the positions they will probably reclaim sooner or later in this counterattack. But um, we're going to have a interesting few days, and I'm going to have a few nights without without much sleep. Now the other part. Gorbachev has died. And, you know, I highly recommend that everyone listens to my episodes about... Um, about, well, Gorbi. Because... Well, Gorbachev right now is being praised by everyone as this great leader and, and the one who did a lot of great things and, you know, that uh, he was, like, the last great leader in, like, Pizza Hut commercials and all this stuff. But you still have to remember that uh, he absolutely mishandled and even kind of made much worse the situation in Chernobyl, at least at the beginning. Listen to that episode and listen to my Gorbi episode. His perestroika was very poorly implemented. And uh, both from the side that I was on, I was born in, that wanted the Soviet Union to collapse, and the side that wanted to keep it going. And he really economically blockaded Lithuania, and also gave the order to squash rebels with tanks there, and people died there. You know, sure, he did, he did a lot of good. I have to admit that he tried to build this socialism with a human face, and he was always a communist and remained a communist. But he's by no means a saint. Not in the Baltics, at least. And uh, he also was very supportive of Putin in 2014 with the Crimean annexation. So, you know, that's a historical figure that you should treat with some nuance. Nuance is kind of lost these days, obviously. Everything's black and white. But Gorby, you know, there, there's a lot of good things that I could say about him, but a lot of bad as well. And I... And I'm starting to think that in the West, you know, in the West, everyone just talks about mostly the good parts and forget the bad ones. And I think they they should be mentioned as well. However, amidst Girkin and his buddies, you know, the peoples that I like to quote on the show, that whose perspective I try to give you as well, you know, while trying to analyze what's going on in, in their minds. Oh boy. They um they hate gotta be for the very same reasons that you and the West tend to call him a good person. Here's what Igor Girkin had to say about him. Quote, This creature does not need to wish for eternal shame. He has acquired it forever. It makes no sense to curse this creature. Contempt is the best that he deserved and deserves. The only thing I'm curious about is whether he remembered about the soul before his death and tried at least before his death to rethink and reevaluate his life. Or did, le- did he leave like Vladimir Volfovich Zhirinovsky, without confession and communion? Comments turned off. In my opinion, this deceased is not worth it for normal Russian, and not only, people to discuss his death on my page. For, re- for me, even dead, he will remain none other than Gorby the Juras. And then there is a Voyankor Katyonak Z, Russian military reporter, who just posted a single sentence. No one will escape the doomsday. Gorbachev has died. May the Lord have retribution for him. It's kind of kind of interesting. And Andrei Medvedev, politician and influencer, also stated about him, quote, Since the beginning of the special military operation, My- Mikhail Gorbachev is already the fourth deceased politician who was directly involved in the collapse of the USSR. Shushkevich, Kravchuk, Stankevich, and now Gorbachev. Three signed the Belovzhenskaya Bilov- Accords, which became the unconditional foundation of what is happening today in Ukraine. And the fourth, one brought, brought the country to his fata, to this fatal Belovzhenskaya line. This, of course, is all some kind of almost mythical coincidence. They really, they really hate him. One of one other reporter, Vladian Tatarsky, states. There is no ecstasy over the death of 92-year-old Gorbachev, but there is annoyance that he died without a verdict by a tribunal that would thoroughly investigate the activities of this man. <laughs> and of course, Putin himself, quote, by words of Vladimir Peskov, his press secretary. Putin expressed deep condolences regarding the death of Mikhail Gorbachev. In the morning, he will be say, Putin will send a telegram to relatives and friends. So you see, 
today I was also listening on some Telegram spaces where, you know, people stated that this journalist that, that has a lot of Russian friends from the liberal circles, basically, and she stated that those Russian liberal friends had sent her a lot of messages, you know, saying that, oh, no, so, so bad that Gorby died, that he was a true liberal and all this stuff. But Russian liberals, uh, they deserve their own criticisms, which I have delivered plenty on this show. And again, Gorbachev, well, hated by a lot of people in Russia, a lot of these in-depth people, and, well, maybe loved by liberals, but also hated for different reasons here in the Baltics and in a lot of places in Ukraine. Lithuanian Minister of Defense openly stated that Gorbachev was also a bad person and a war criminal. He literally uh, he literally still continued the war in Afghanistan, and there's a lot of things that he could have, got, could, have, could have done differently. He was by no means the saint that the West portray him as right now these days. And also, he was by no means as terrible a villain that these Girkin and his buddies try to portray him as. He was a complex figure, and I think his memory, well, he deserves a place in history books, definitely, because he's also stated that Putin has destroyed his legacy. So, well, uh, I, I, I'm just wanting to say to you that you should probably go and learn more about Gorbachev before making some rash statements. And again, I wish this would go on a bit longer because Kherson Offensive is interesting and there's a lot of new events happening. But uh, I must I must stay true to my journalist ethics and be a professional here and not just reveal something that could hurt Ukrainians right now. And finally, well, you know, the final thing is I think it blew up on Twitter a bit. Uh, I don't usually go for viral tweets and I don't know why, but this one got very viral because you see... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in Athens. This is not my vacation. This is my mom's. My mom, poor soul, hasn't been outside of Latvia since 1985. And back then, her last vacation was on the Solovets Islands in the White Sea. And that's north of Archangel, Archangelsk. Up there. Look it up the map. It's very, very north. So she hadn't been anywhere because of her illnesses and everything during all of my existence. And I decided that, you know... I can do some translating and, you know, I can work remotely. I'm fine. So I just wanted to wanted to be a good son and take her to see, you know, history because she's, she's a fan of history. And, and yesterday, yesterday we went out in, in one of these local pubs over here, you know, to, to have dinner. And I'm, I'm just sitting here and, and I'm wearing, if you follow me again on Twitter or on Facebook or anywhere, you've probably seen it. I have this hat that... Um, that I got in Poland that says fuck Putin on it with the U replaced with uh, this resistance fist in Ukrainian flag colors. And um, I was sitting there at the tables. And then this is near um, Marko Street, about five five uh, minutes from Acropolis here in the Athens. Uh, the street name where the whole restaurant thing is is called is something with D. I, it's literally Greek to me. It's very hard to pronounce properly, and it's it's weird. I just know that Evkaristos is thank you, which is interesting, because that reminds me of Eucharist, which is a fun thing. Anyway, I'm sitting there, and, um, and I'm talking Latvian with my mom. <laughs> and there are two Russian, older Russian tourists, and there's a lot of Russians here. I've heard a lot of Russian here in Greece. And there are two Russian tourists who apparently saw my hat, my cap, and heard me talk with my mom in Latvian. They couldn't understand it, but as we didn't use Russian, they didn't know that we, that we were, you know, they didn't know that we could understand them. So these guys, and they're elderly people, I, I would give them about 50, 60-ish maybe, but there's like three of them. So, and then they started talking about, talking about how we are all Nazis, how Ukraine are Nazis, how we in Latvia are extra Nazis, because they maybe recognized the language or something, and how they would totally beat us up if um, only there weren't cops around. And that was interesting, because I, I took a picture of myself because didn't want to get into a lot of trouble. I'm a war correspondent, after all, not a, bro, not a, boar, bro, not a boar bar brawler, sorry. But, um, but yeah, I solved the situation by just giving um, a decent decent sized tip to the waiter, pulling him aside and, uh, you know, telling him to just, you know, look after me a bit. And as we were leaving with mom, yeah, I, uh, I said uh, to the to the guys, 
Спасибо за халявное развлечение. You know, just in Russian, which basically means thank you for the free entertainment. Throwing in a bit of prison slang and um, yeah, those guys. Oh boy, they stared at me. They they stared down at me. But then this 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 waiter comes up and he's he he's like a big guy, like a really big guy with a huge mustache, and he just stared him down. So that was interesting. And, and yeah, and this this went viral. So if you're listening to my show for the first time ever, then you probably came from that tweet. And I don't know. A lot of people are using this as an argument to deny visas to to Russians, and I know that my government, in, together with Finland, Estonia, Lithuania, and Poland, we kind of pressured the EU to basically cut down on the easing of of uh, Schengen zone visas for Russians by literally threatening that we will just sl- stop the blo- stop the flow of Russians inside the EU anyways if if they if they try to kind of give out those visas. It's an interesting situation, really, and of course we'll continue giving out giving out uh, visas for humanitarian reasons. That's that's how that's obviously gonna happen, but it's a little bit weird and interesting. I probably won't be sleeping tonight. I'll be closely following what's gonna happen with the Herson situation. I wanted to say thank you to all my patrons. Please consider becoming a patron of our show on patreoncom slash border. Or if you follow me on Twitter, you can click the little money icon in my prof- in my profile. That'll take you there. Uh, we we charge per four, maybe five episodes per month. It, it says monthly, but it's actually per. It used to be one episode. It used to be per episode when I was doing my historical stuff, one episode per week. Now it's it's for those bigger episodes, and and I don't charge for every episode. So don't worry. And like I said, it's uh, I think I think it's four or five episodes per month, depending on the amount of effort I've put in, because I have to eat and stuff. And uh, of course, I'm going back to Ukraine. I'm going back to Ukraine in 22nd, 23rd of September. I'm going to fly to Warsaw, have a train to Kiev, and from there have some interesting connections. Because you see, I uh, I spoke with this this girl from Kharkiv on Twitter. And she's a volunteer there, and she organizes help, although she suffered from war, from the war herself. She organizes help for for all the Ukrainians and uh, for elderly people who can't help themselves. So I, I'm, I'm going to still look at the drone situation up until then, what's, what's happening with that, and how much money we have, and what can we buy from all this list and everything. But uh, But yeah, I have this all under account, and we'll be giving you proper accounting on how much we have, just about, I think a week before we go, about how much we have, how much we're going to donate, and all this stuff, with uh, full responsibility and all the goods that we can get. It's a long war. It's not pleasant to talk about it. But hey, at least at least I'm promised by, uh, by my Ukrainian contacts that I'll get a very special, very special hat from Ukraine. Because, you know, I collect caps, and, well, that's one positive thing. I really hope that by the time that happens, we will have a lot more positive things to talk about. Happiness is mandatory. До свидания, товарищи.